Welcome to another week of Come Follow Me, Doctrine and Covenants 37 through 40. Some beautiful little sections with some really powerful one-liners that we get to enjoy. 37, section 37, verse 1, go to the Ohio. 39, 14, go to the Ohio. 38, 38, you'll be endowed with power from on high. The reason the Lord gathered the saints from New York to Ohio was so that they could build the Kirtland Temple. The saints would learn sacrifice, they would learn obedience, and Jesus Christ himself would appear. Uh, Moses and Elijah and Elias would appear. Priesthood keys, keys of sealing, truly an endowment of power from on high. So the Lord's invitation is, go to the Ohio and I will give you this great blessing. Now, for us, I think the blessing is very simple. Do what the Lord asks and you will be blessed. We don't always get a canonized revelation to tell us to do this or to do that. But when prophets speak and we follow, and when the Spirit speaks and we follow, we will be blessed and endowed with power from on high. In section 38, verse 1, the Savior says, Thus saith the Lord your God, even Jesus Christ, the great I am. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the same which looked upon the wide expanse of eternity and all the seraphic, those are angelic hosts of heaven before the world was made, the same which knoweth all things and all things are present before mine eyes. I'm reminded of that great little clip from Elder Uchtdorf back in October 2020 when he said, the pandemic didn't take God by surprise. There's still a lot of unknowns about this virus. But if there's one thing I do know, this virus did not catch Heavenly Father by surprise. This virus did not catch Heavenly Father by surprise. He did not have to muster additional battalions of angels, call emergency meetings, or divert resources from the World Creation Division to handle an unexpected need. Our Heavenly Father and the Savior Jesus Christ know everything. That's one of the reasons that we can trust them when a prompting from the Spirit comes. That's one reason we can trust God's prophets when they're speaking for the Lord and teaching us the Lord's will and the Lord's way. They know everything. I just add my testimony of the Savior Jesus Christ. He is the Savior of the world. I loved General Conference this past weekend and so many powerful testimonies of Jesus Christ I know Jesus is the Savior of the world, truly the Christ, the Anointed One. Elder Holland made an observation about Jesus Christ that I'd like to play just a little clip for. We will sing and we'll shout with the armies of heaven. Hosanna, Hosanna to God and the Lamb as Jesus descends with his chariot of fire. I testify that hour will come, that God, our eternal Father, will again send to this earth his only begotten Son, this time to rule and reign as King of kings forever. For this promised hour to come, I longingly pray for this promised hour to come I longingly pray for this promised hour to come. I longingly pray. I love that little clip, the King of Kings. I was reading in my Old Testament book of Zechariah uh, yesterday, in fact, and saw this verse, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And I add my testimony to Elder Holland's that Jesus is coming back to the earth. I hope that you've begun to pick up that so many of our leaders, when they speak to us in these semi-annual general conferences, are talking about the second coming of the Lord. And the whole purpose of the gathering of Israel is to gather Israel in preparation for the second coming of the Lord. It's a great time to be studying the Doctrine and Covenants because we do get to talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ many times.
Do you remember when Pilate was interviewing Christ and he asks him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus says, To this end was I born. Section 38, verse 22 of the Doctrine and Covenants reminds us, Hear my voice and follow me. When I come, there's a hint towards the second coming, I am your lawgiver. I hope that we understand that when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth, as Zechariah said, to be king over all the earth, and that he will be the lawgiver, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a democracy. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a kingdom, and we are to follow as we would a king. I love that. I love knowing that Jesus is coming back to be king of the earth. 2020 may go down in the history books as a year of anti-racism. Black lives matter, and uh, of late, Asian lives matter, and all lives matter. But I'm wondering, why in the world did it take us so long? January 2nd, 1831, section 38 was revealed with these great one-liners. Let every man esteem his brother as himself and practice virtue and holiness. Again, I say unto you, let every man esteem his brother as himself. 27, be one. And if ye are not one, ye are not mine. I love that. The Lord's invitation to be united. He actually calls it a parable, which would make it, I think, the shortest parable in all of Scripture. Here's a parable. Parables are stories with layers of meaning. I wonder what all the layers of meaning are with this one. This is worth discussing as a husband and a wife, as a family, as an elders quorum, as a relief society, as a ward, as a stake. Be one. And if ye are not one, ye are not mine. Here's a collection of short little clips that we've received recently in General Conference about the importance of being one and not being racist, but being united and being together. Unity doesn't magically happen. It takes work, it's messy, sometimes it's uncomfortable, and it happens gradually when we clear away the bad as fast as the good can grow. We're never alone in our efforts to create unity. Jacob 5 continues, The servants did go and labor with their mites, and the Lord of the vineyard labored also with them. Each of us is going to have deeply wounding experiences, things that should never happen. Each of us is going to have deeply wounding experiences, things that should never happen. Jesus Christ is our Savior in all things. Jesus Christ is our Savior in all things. Jesus Christ is our Savior in all things. His power reaches to the very bottom and is reliably there for us when we call on Him. Anyone who claims superiority under the Father's plan because of characteristics like race, sex, nationality, language, or economic circumstances is morally wrong, is morally wrong, is morally wrong, and does not understand the Lord's true purpose for all of our Father's children. Much of society has lost its moorings and does not understand why we are on this earth. When we think of Adam and Eve, often our first thought is of their idyllic life in the Garden of Eden. I imagine that the weather was always perfect, not too hot and not too cold. They also were given commandments to obey and had different ways of approaching those instructions, which caused some initial anxiety and confusion. But as they made decisions that changed their lives forever, they learned to work together and became united in accomplishing the purposes God had for them and for all of His children. As centuries and then millennia came and went, the clarity of men's and women's inspired and interdependent contributions became clouded with misinformation and misunderstandings. During the time between that marvelous beginning in the Garden of Eden and now, the adversary has been quite successful in his goal to divide men and women in his attempts to conquer our souls. Lucifer knows that if he can damage the unity men and women feel, if he can confuse us about our divine worth and covenant responsibilities, he will succeed in destroying families, which are the essential units of eternity. Satan incites comparison as a tool to create feelings of being superior or inferior, 
Satan incites comparison as a tool to create feelings of being superior or inferior, hiding the eternal truth that men's and women's innate differences are God-given and equally valued. His goal has been to foster a power struggle rather than a celebration of the unique contributions of men and women that complement one another and contribute to unity. Each of us has a divine potential because each is a child of God. Each is equal in his eyes. The implications of this truth are profound. Brothers and sisters, please listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Brothers and sisters, please listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Brothers and sisters, please listen carefully to what I'm about to say. God does not love one race more than another. His doctrine on this matter is clear. He invites all to come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. I assure you that your standing before God is not determined by the color of your skin. Favor or disfavor with God is dependent upon your devotion to God and His commandments and not to the color of your skin. I grieve that our black brothers and sisters during the, uh, the world over are enduring the pains of racism and prejudice. Today, I call upon our members everywhere to lead out in abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice. Today, I call upon our members everywhere to lead out in abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice. I plead with you to promote respect for all of God's children. I add my tiny witness along with theirs. We are commanded to be one. We've got to stop racism of all kind, and we've got to be one. I particularly love, from just this last conference, this next clip from President Oaks, where he invited us to stop dividing ourselves within our wards politically. Listen for him to counsel us that there is no place in the church for judging each other based on who we voted for. It may require changing party support or candidate choices, even from election to election. Such independent actions will sometimes require voters to support candidates or political parties or platforms whose other positions they cannot approve. That is one reason we encourage our members to refrain from judging one another in political matters. Refrain from judging one another in political matters. We should never assert, we should never assert that a faithful Latter-day Saint cannot belong to a particular party or vote for a particular candidate. We teach correct principles and leave our members to choose how to prioritize and apply those principles on the issues presented from time to time. What a great clip. And I hope and I pray that we will listen to President Oaks and stop letting political separation divide us as members in our wards. Diversity is wonderful in skin color and in politics, and we better listen to President Oaks's warning. Here's another great one-liner from section 38. I love this verse. If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. I remember Elder Bednar in the October 2020 conference telling us about going through and examining his own food storage and realizing he wasn't as prepared as he needed to be. And he encouraged us with this verse to be prepared. That's wonderful to have water and food and some savings, all of the things that we would need to make it through an economic crisis. But the best kind of preparation is spiritual preparation. And we better be spiritually built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ so that when those storms come, that we will not be moved from our moorings 
anchored to the Savior Jesus Christ. I love it. If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. We talked about being endowed with power from on high, but here that promise is repeated in two verses. And the promise from the Lord is that the idea that he'll open the windows of heaven and pour out power upon us. I have a testimony of the power of covenants. I have a testimony of walking the covenant path. In just this last conference, Elder Christofferson used this verse and this phrase and promised us an endowment of great power by walking the covenant path. Following the principles and commandments of the gospel of Jesus Christ day by day is the happiest and most satisfying course in life. For one thing, a person avoids a great many problems and regrets. Let me use a sports analogy. In tennis, there's something called unforced errors. These are things such as hitting a playable ball into the net or double faulting when serving. Unforced errors are considered the result of a player's blunder rather than being caused by the opponent's skill. Too often, our problems or challenges are self-inflicted, the result of poor choices, or we could say the result of unforced errors. When we are diligently pursuing the covenant path, we quite naturally avoid many unforced errors. We sidestep the various forms of addiction. We do not fall into the ditch of dishonest conduct. We cross over the abyss of immorality and infidelity. We bypass the people and things that, even if popular, would jeopardize our physical and spiritual well-being. We avoid the choices that harm or disadvantage others and instead acquire the habits of self-discipline and service. Staying on, not just crossing the covenant path, is our greatest hope for avoiding avoidable misery on the one hand and successfully dealing with the unavoidable woes of life on the other. That's great, and I love him, and I hope that we will walk the covenant path. Now, here's a quiz for you. Who gave the classic 1989 talk, Beware of Pride? Any ideas? Any ideas? Who gave the classic talk? Beware of pride in 1989. Any hints? Any hints? Are you seeing any names over here? Well, watch the video and learn. President Benson has felt that he would rather have this read than to read it. We're grateful for his presence. He honors us. We love him as we know he loves us. I shall now read the message which he has prepared for the opening of this conference. This sacred volume was written for us, for our day. Its scriptures are to be likened unto ourselves. The Doctrine and Covenants tells us that the Book of Mormon is the record of a fallen people. Why did they fall? This is one of the major messages of the Book of Mormon. Mormon gives the answer in the closing chapters of the book in these words. Behold the pride of this nation, or the people of the Nephites hath proven their destruction. And then, lest we miss that momentous Book of Mormon message from that fallen people, the Lord warns us in the Doctrine and Covenants, Beware of pride, lest ye become as the Nephites of old. At the end of this world, when God cleanses the earth by fire, the proud will be burned to stubble, and the meek shall inherit the earth. Pride is a very misunderstood sin, and many are sinning in ignorance. Most of us think of pride as self-centeredness, conceit, boastfulness, arrogance, or haughtiness. All of these are elements of the sin, but the heart or core is still missing. The central feature of pride is enmity. Enmity toward God and enmity toward our fellow men. Enmity means hatred, hatred toward, 
hostility to, or a state of opposition. It is the power by which Satan wishes to reign over us. The proud cannot accept the authority of God giving direction to their lives. We are tempted daily to elevate ourselves above others and diminish them. In the words of C.S. Lewis, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition is gone, pride has gone. The proud stand more in fear of men's judgments than of God's judgments. Our motives for the things we do are where the sin is manifest. Disobedience is essentially a prideful power struggle against someone in authority over us. Contention in our families drives the Spirit of the Lord away. The scriptures testify that the proud are easily offended and hold grudges. The proud do not receive counsel or correction easily. Defensiveness is used by them to justify and rationalize their frailties and failures. Pride is ugly. Pride is a damning sin in the true sense of that word. Pride is the universal sin, the great vice. The antidote for pride is humility. Let us choose to be humble. We can choose to humble ourselves by loving God, submitting our will to His, and putting Him first in our lives. Let us choose to be humble. We can do it. I know we can. Pride is the great stumbling block of Zion. I repeat, pride is the great stumbling block of Zion. Wait a minute, what's that? President Benson's classic talk, Beware of Pride, was not delivered by President Benson. You could see him sitting there on the stand but President Gordon B. Hinckley actually delivered President Benson's talk, Beware of Pride. In a subsequent conference, Elder Uchtdorf quoted much of President Benson's talk on pride and added a great couple of twists. Here's a clip from that talk from Elder Uchtdorf. Often we mark the span of our lives by events that leave imprints on our minds and on our hearts. There are many such events in my life, one of which happened in 1989 when I heard a timeless sermon by President Ezra Taft Benson, Beware of Pride. In the introduction, it was noted that this topic had been weighing heavily on President Benson's soul for some time. I felt a similar burden during the past months. The promptings of the Holy Spirit have urged me to add my voice as another witness to President Benson's message delivered 21 years ago. Every mortal has at least a casual, if not intimate, relationship with the sin of pride. No one has avoided it. Few overcome it. That's great. And now the question, why? Why beware of pride? The Lord gave the answer right in the scriptures. Lest ye become as the Nephites of old. They became extinct. Beware of pride. Pride will steal from you your salvation, your spiritual life, your connection to God. Pride can steer you off of the covenant path. Brothers and sisters, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we should frequently and often say, I'm sorry. Say, my fault. I'll try harder. This is the gospel where we're trying to be better. We're striving to become Latter-day Saints. So being aware of pride, meaning, as Elder Uchtdorf said, humbling ourselves so that we don't take offense, we strive not to give offense, and we forgive quickly. Beware of pride lest you become extinct. 
I want to end today with this little story about James Colville. You'll notice in the heading to section 39 that he'd been a Methodist minister for 40 years. And he came and when he found out about the gospel, he promised Joseph Smith, you go to the Lord, get me a revelation and I will do anything. I will do anything to make it right. So in section 39, the Lord said, all right, thine heart is now right. Go to the Ohio just like was commanded back in our first slide. I've got great things coming. Go to the Ohio. Jesus is coming to the Ohio. Moses, Elijah, Elias are coming to the Ohio. Revelations will come that will restore the temple endowment and put you on the eternal covenant path to exaltation. Go to the Ohio. Section 40. James Colville rejected the word of the Lord. And he went back to his former congregation and people. He gave up receiving endowment from on high. And the Lord said that his heart was right. That becomes the concluding question for us today. And come follow me. How's your heart? Would the Lord say of you right now? Thine heart is now right. Or would the Lord say, the heart was right. I invite each of us to do some pondering and some praying and some evaluating with the Lord. How's my heart? Is my heart right? Am I accepting counsel from the Lord? Am I following the Lord's prophets? Is my heart right? Do I feel the way I should feel about my calling? Is my heart right? Do I feel how I should feel about my ministering assignments? Is my heart right? Or was it right? Let's do everything in our power to set our feet on the covenant path and make and keep our heart right. In October 2019, President Russell M. Nelson taught that women who are endowed in the temple have priesthood power in their lives and in their homes as they keep those sacred covenants they made with God. He explained that the heavens are just as open to women who are endowed with God's power flowing from their priesthood covenants as they are to men who bear the priesthood, end quote. And he encouraged every sister to draw liberally upon the Savior's power to help your family and others you love. One of the keys is to understand that when women and men work together, we accomplish a great deal more than we do working separately. Our roles are complementary rather than competitive. Although women are not ordained to a priesthood office, as noted previously, women are blessed with priesthood power as they keep their covenants, and they operate with priesthood authority when they are set apart to a calling.